This episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks is brought to you by Gigabyte's AMD X570 ARS motherboards for third generation AMD Ryzen 3000 process. Description below for more details. In this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we're going to talk all things many core Ryzen with a very special guest from AMD. Next. Welcome back to yet another episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. <sighs> it's been one of those weeks. We've been grinding. I'm Dave Altavilla. Good to see you again. I'm with always, as always, the incomparable and ever fascinating Marco Cipetta, who's burning the midnight oil as well. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing okay. I'm always so surprised when you're so complimentary of me. It's very strange. <laughs> well, you got to come up with the superlatives. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, now that we're talking superlatives, we might as well cut to the the, the man of the hour, the guy that uh, really is uh, what this, this little podcast is going to be uh, all about today. And that's Robert Halleck from AMD. And uh, you might call him the Ryzen master, I guess, uh, but uh, <laughs> he's also ever fabulous, especially when he launches a, a great product uh, like like the folks at AMD did today. How you doing, Robert? I'm great. Marco, Dave, thanks for having me on. Um, for the record, I am the man making Marco burn the midnight oil. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. We we love that about you, and uh, we appreciate it. Um, yeah, Robert, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, just so the folks get familiar with who you are, if they haven't seen you already. Um, you are you are about the interwebs as well, um, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your position at AMD, your name, rank, and serial number, all that good stuff, if you wouldn't uh, mind. Name, rank, yeah, sure. Uh, so my <laughs> name is Robert Hellick, and uh, I've been at AMD for about ten years now. Time flies. And uh, I lead technical marketing for AMD's CPU business. So amongst the things that I do, um, I help pick benchmarks that are relevant to the public and to the reviewer community, make sure that data can be easily repeated. Um, and then I, you know, I design how to talk about the product and make sure that people have the answers that they need. Gotcha. Delivering the message of of uh, of all things Ryzen, excellent. Um, and folks, by the way, we're we're going to keep this open format today, so please feel free to fire your questions into the chat. Actually, Chris, yes, thank you. He teed it right up. <laughs> um, great minds think alike, there, Chris. Chris is behind the curtain working the the volume knobs and dials, and um, so yeah. But we'll um, we will uh, you know field your questions as well. Anything that's uh, you know a burning burning topic in your mind for for Robert, we'll uh, we'll get that in there. Try and get that in when we when we can. Um, so so Robert, you you guys have been busy folks over there these days, and I must say, Marco and I are are both impressed. Um, 3950X is looking fantastic. Before it, the, the launch of the 3900X, um, fantastic, and really bringing a lot of value um, to the mainstream and high-end desktop space, uh, value and performance. How does it feel now that this big launch is behind you? How you uh, how you doing over there? Can you catch your breath now? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's uh, we still got some products to go, Threadripper, uh, which we'll talk about. But um, you know, before we started the show, we were chatting about the idea that these flagship products uh, represent a lot of heart and soul for the engineers and for the team. You know, it's that shining beacon on the hill. It's that one product that everybody aspires to. And so there's a lot emotionally riding on a product like the 3950X for those of us at AMD. And so the reviews have been killer. Um, just amazing power efficiency, amazing performance, no slouch of gaming. It, it's, it's a pretty rare recipe to see a CPU like that. And so we're just thrilled. And you guys wrote a great review for us today, and we thank you. Um, but it's been glowing across the web, so everybody's really happy today. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. Um, in what we do, um, a lot of times there's, you know, a lot of nuance in in not only the the backstory behind a product, but also the, even just this, the simple performance metrics across different you know, types of workloads and efficiency you know power efficiency and thermals and all that good stuff and and so you have to sort of sift through it and digest it and but there's the rare occasion or at least more rare than uh perhaps you might think where a product is just like across the board good like you're, you're yeah. not finding a compromise <laughs> 
And uh, I, th- I think that's where we were at with the 3950X today, to be quite honest. And we don't, we don't see that enough. I think so. I mean, you have the most number of cores in our portfolio, the highest single thread performance in our portfolio. It got great gaming performance. It has power efficiency that's like twice as good as competing parts. It has everything. And I'm not going to say it's cheap at 749 because it's not. That's a big purchase for a lot of people. But it is a good value. And um, I, I think that's kind of emblematic of Ryzen in general, that kind of regardless of what we're bringing to the market, we at least want it to be a good value. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, comparatively, when you think about um, uh, other solutions in the market from from your primary competitor, Intel, obviously, uh, when you look at their highest end 18, 18 core, where frankly, we had it right in the, in the charts, in the benchmark charts, uh, you know, you guys are, going tooth and nail with that thing, beating it more often than not, and it retails for over $2,000, it's hard to argue that value equation, even if it is a pricey purchase for the average mainstream yeah. consumer. Yeah. I I'm, mean, it I'm is... Go ahead. reminded of a blog that they, that they published um, about a year ago talking about the importance of, of single CPU cores. And here's AMD with 16 cores beating 18 pretty consistently. So... Yeah. I think that really shows you how fast Zen 2 is uh, and how efficient it is and what it can really do when it can stretch its legs in a product like the 3950X. I really hope people get a chance to try it because it's special. It's a special product. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to dig into what makes it special. I have a couple of ideas, and I think uh, you have obviously probably all the answers. But Marco, um, you kicked the tires and lit the fires on this thing personally. Uh, What did you think? So I thought it was awesome, and you know, it's it's funny. It's not funny, but it's interesting. Robert mentions the value proposition of a seven hundred and fifty dollars processor, and I for for a moment, as I was writing the conclusion, I, I struggled with popping in a recommended or editor's choice because you know seven hundred fifty bucks is not cheap, but with this launch, and AMD did it with the first Ryzen launch as well, they they've literally shifted the paradigm on what you can expect from a mainstream socket. Like this is the first time you can get a 16 core incredibly powerful system in that mainstream socket without having to spring for now you're going to want to spring for an enthusiast class motherboard with a chip like this but you don't need to go for those crazy high end HEDT motherboards and you know as we saw in the benchmarks this 16 core 3950 uh competed very favorably with an 18 core 9980XE and it's not just in terms of the benchmarks the power was just so much better on the 3950X. And that's discounting the eco mode, which basically still hung with that high-end chip, but cut the power to like Core i5 levels. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really interesting processor. And, and if, if I was spending my money today, I would save my pennies mm-hmm. to try to save up and get to 3950X. It was that nice. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're all really happy to hear that. <laughs> Yeah, no, no I mean, it's it's killer killer process. Like it was one of those one of those reviews where as I'm compiling the data, I'm like, wow, that looked good. Uh, oh, that looked good. And then you're looking yeah. at the graphs and you're coloring, you know, you're sorting, and I'm like, whoa, that looks really good. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it was just it was literally strong across the board. If you want to nitpick, and this is something you guys addressed in the original uh, launch, idle power is higher than expected, but I believe that was uh, due to the, how quickly the chips are, are are changing frequencies or something to that effect, right, Robert? Uh, it, it's something that we're looking at. We, we've heard that from a few reviewers. I don't have a clear answer yet. We got to look okay. at it. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean it's it's uh, it is it is refreshing. It keeps it's it makes our job easy when when we don't have to sift through all the different data points mm-hmm. and uh, and you can just say yeah, here's the here's the story and it's definitive and good stuff. Um, what what is it about the architecture? Do you think? I mean, you know, in my mind, there's some I guess strategic decisions you folks made way early on that um, afford you this power efficiency and performance um you know but when when you look at for example i mean it, you know let's face it intel's individual core performance is no slouch i mean their their single threaded performance is strong sure. and when you talk about an 18 core cpu from them granted it's expensive and you know draws a ton of power and and you guys are 
are beating them in, in many cases with 16 cores and some of these workloads. I think of, you know, the, the, the single attribute that might be contributing to that performance. And I think about, you've got, you know, seven nanometer chiplets that, you know, very efficiency, uh, very efficient from a silicon real estate consumption uh, standpoint, big fat cash. I think about yeah. that cash and how that plays in with your performance. Is that, is that part of, uh, the architecture you think along with infinity fabric and all that good stuff, um, that contributes there? Sure. Cash is a major contributor to the overall IPC of, of any processor. And, you know, it, it was a conscious decision to bring more memory closer to the execution engines by increasing that cache size. And that has paid dividends for us. Um, you know, in, in tasks like gaming, we're seeing the cache contribute 30-something percent additional performance on top of IPC, on top of memory overclocking. Just It is its own bucket of performance improvement. And so to have um, you know, 72 megs of that, I think that's right, uh, on yeah. that chip, is, it's a huge, huge amount. Um, and, and so the story for, for us, what we're very proud of is um, you're seeing chiplets come to bear uh, in a big way scaling up those core counts economically in a mainstream socket. You're seeing our process pull away from the competition this year. You're seeing our power consumption far better than what they're able to bring in, in their portfolio. And so kind of everything is coming together in, in one set of products this year for us. Um, and we're very proud of that. And it represents five, six years of work for multiple teams. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Seven nanometer, all that. I mean, that, that all comes into play. And uh, yeah, the process leadership there, which is something, you know, frankly, you know, your competitor was very well known for. That's why they've been called, you know, they coined the term Chipzilla back in the day uh, because they were just a manufacturing juggernaut. And um, you folks have found a way to, to beat them at that game, which is which is impressive. Um, I don't want to I don't want to ramble on too much here, but Marco, we've got a couple of cues in the in the chat and i know you've got a couple of cues as well right yeah so um, um one of our readers craig is asking how did amd manage to add four more cores without you know cranking up the power so highly was there anything mm. different during the 3950x's qualification or, or design that um you guys took power more into consideration or is it just maturity and binning well it's, it's a couple factors one of the things that um is, is not immediately obvious to enthusiasts is that the engineering effort to bring a product to market is not m merely in designing a chipset, designing a, a reference motherboard and architecture and all that stuff. It's also in um, what we call infrastructure, which is a common set of electrical and thermal guidance that we provide for that socket. Uh, and that dictates the number of VRMs in the board, how many power phases you should have, what the power, what kind of power the socket should be rated for. These are all things that play into the performance of the CPU and the compatibility of multiple chips in one socket. So the we offer multiple infrastructures, 65 watt, 45 watt, 105 watt, and when you have two CPUs in that same group, like say 205 watt chips, uh, they have a cap of 142 watts. And that's, uh, if you look at Ryzen Master, uh, the package power target, or PPT. So we're saying that both the 3900X and the 3950X uh, cannot draw any more than 142 watts from the socket. And um, that's what allows us to pack in additional cores uh, but still manage the power consumption in a way uh, that is is really attractive from a performance per watt perspective. Got it. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. So that was that was, you know, th throughout testing, that was one of the things that I found super interesting. You know, along with eco mode that we mentioned earlier. Now, speaking of eco mode, one thing that I, that I did notice um, in my testing, it didn't really seem to affect idle or, or single core power it, does eco mode is is it really only uh dialing things back when multiple cores are engaged can you explain a little more how that works sure so uh going this is perfect for dovetailing off the infrastructure group topic um when let's say you have 105 watt cpu and now you're taking it down to 65 watt with eco mode 
Um, that's going to limit the power consumption in an all core scenario because there's a new lower limit for maximum power consumption, a new PPT value. But it, it's not going to change the idle behavior of the chip. And all of the parts are approximately the same, right? Because you're not running into an electrical limit or a thermal limit or anything like that. Got it. Makes sense. And now it seems to me, you know, we have um, we had a couple of developments the last couple of weeks. I, I'm, the name escapes me, but I know a member of the community, and it went live on, on another site, kind of came up with a, a, a a power profile for third gen Ryzen. And we also have the, the November Microsoft update coming. It, with tweaks to the power profile and the scheduler changes coming in Windows, it, it, is it fair to say that in another month or two, perhaps the performance of the 3950 may look even better or or was today sort of best case scenario and it, it, the performance is what it is? I, I, of course, I would love to promise more performance. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the reality is that these processors are very straightforward. You get the latest BIOS, you get the latest chipset driver, keep Windows up to date, and that's going to give you the best possible performance. You don't need a third-party power plan. You don't need an update to the second half Windows update. You can if you want. Um, it's available now, but uh, there is nothing in this new build of Windows uh, that makes Ryzen any better because we've already done that work uh, in Windows 10 May 2019 update, which came out in May. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. So we had we had a question come in that I'm going to answer because I think the reader is a little bit misinformed. He's asking why the memory clock is so low at 30, at only 3200 megahertz. Um, that's actually faster than uh, anything on the Intel offers on the desktop by a wide margin. 2666 is the fastest speed on some of Intel's highest chips, um, and that's that's the official. Uh, support for 32 megahertz, you can go way higher with with overclocking as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that that's a, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong, but go ahead, Dave. I hear you trying to chime in. There, yeah, so. no, I, I was going to ask, and actually, I th I think what what perhaps might be a, a better question off of that, and maybe what he was alluding to, uh, Peter Frankowitz. I th maybe we have that right. <laughs> it's an interesting spelling, um, but I th I think maybe what he was alluding to was. You know what what performance gain could be had if it was perhaps a little bit north of 3200 megahertz. What what sort of in this architecture, third gen, you know, 16 core Ryzen. If if we increase that memory bandwidth a, a little bit more, you know, what's the what's the ROI on that? Perhaps it's going to be hugely variable. It it depends on how sensitive that game is to memory speed. Some games. Uh, fit comfortably in the large cache and are effectively immune to adjustments to memory speed. They don't care. Other games do a lot of random small reads from memory and, and they'll go a lot faster. But, uh, you know, it, it gets subtle on this product because of the large cache size. The benefit of overclocked memory diminishes versus first and second gen Ryzen. So uh, memory kits like 3200 cast latency 14 or 3600 cast latency 16 were actually very comparable because of their random access latency. Um, you know, those, those, the, the time to access that first little bit of data on those two memory speed grades is actually very close. Um, so yes, you'll get some out of uh, additional clocking on the memory side, but our guidance is that somewhere between 3200 and 3600 is, is going to be fine like you don't need to if you don't want to but our i would also say our official guidance if you're going to overclock um 3600 cast latency 16 widely available in the market very affordable great option for Ryzen. got it so that's kind of the sweet spot that was the next question from craig in the chat yeah. as well what's the three uh, sweet spot 3600 yeah it's it Easily doable on any of the chips that I've ever encountered. Widespread success in the public. Of course, I can't officially recommend it because it violates the AMD warranty. But if you can <laughs> do it, that's a great choice. The, I, well, that's a, that's an interesting question. Is it? Is it? Does it doesn't really violate the warranty? <laughs> I mean, technically, I mean, you'd, you'd still warranty it if someone was overclocking your memory, right? I mean, I'm not an attorney, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> got it got it i won't hold your feet to the fire i appreciate that and, so, so and Robert, thank god sorry. you're not an attorney by the way <laughs> 
<laughs> Go ahead, Marco. So with with uh, with the first gen with first gen Ryzen, um, the memory clock was tied uh, tightly coupled with uh, with the Infinity Fabric clock, and due to the the way those chips were designed, the, the memory speed could have a much larger impact on overall system mm. performance. Is the the new the new chiplet uh, set up with the I/O die and all that cache? Is it sort of well, first, is is the memory clock still tied to the Infi Infinity Fabric clock, and is is that you know the performance benefit there sort of mitigated because of all the cache and, and the, the different architecture? So it's it's bimodal now, uh, up to DDR4 3600, which is actually 1800 megahertz for viewers. Um, the Infinity Fabric clock speed is tied one to one. So if you have 1800 megahertz memory clock, you have an 1800 megahertz fabric clock which means all the parts on the chip that communicate via the fabric are now running at 18 megahertz, 1800 megahertz. And that's a performance improvement. That's where one of the big benefits comes from. In addition to accessing the memory, it's also just all the cores and IO die and all that stuff can talk to one another that much faster. If you go one megahertz beyond 3600, we call it two to one mode, where the unified memory controller now runs at half the memory speed. So if you had 1800 megahertz memory, you have a 900 megahertz memory controller, and the Infinity Fabric stays at 1800. Now, you can undo that. If you want to go back to everything tied together, one to one to one, you can. There are BIOS settings, and we see a lot of people going all the way up to. DDR4 3800, which is a 1900 megahertz fabric clock. So they're still tied together, uh, but to your point about cache, the larger caches um, essentially diminishes or reduces the need for faster fabric uh, and faster memory as well, because it, it, it is memory of its own sort. It's another way to um, make gaming faster without running fabric clocks and memory clocks higher. Yeah, got it. Cool. And, and, and you, um, you're referring to gaming quite a bit, obviously, I mean, for me, and this is an interesting question. I think we pondered when you, when you look at, um, you know, the value proposition, uh, and price point, um, for whatever use case, 3950 X 16 core, you know, a lot of games might not tax, um, that many number of threads, 32 threads, um, it, 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 what do you think about uh, 3950X in terms of a gaming CPU versus something like a 3900X? Um, what, do, what are your thoughts there? To me, when I when I hear 16 core, you know, a chip north of $700, I think more content creation workstation professional. Um, certainly a great gaming chip if it has that kind of single thread performance that the 3950X has as well. But what, what were your thoughts on that whole uh, balance curve there? Oh, well, yeah, when you start getting into these higher core count chips, it tends to get pretty nebulous really fast. It tends to be, well, who buys this thing? Well, enthusiasts. Okay, which kind is it? Is it the guy who just wants the best hardware money can buy? A lot of those. Uh, is it the kind of person, uh, maybe an artist, and she needs the fastest rendering performance possible? Well, 16 cores will get you there. Uh, other people just want the top gaming performance, and 3950X with with its clocks and its cache size is is our best gaming chip. Um, you know, and yes, incrementally higher than the 3900X, but for some people, that last couple percent is worth it. So um, it's very blurry, and the cool thing is, though, there's one product that satisfies all three of those customers. Yeah. Yeah, and it's all in the same socket, and yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. I was actually I was actually looking over at my system, which is a main gear, powered by a Ryzen nine thirty nine hundred X, and I'm nice. thinking, oh, the nine fifty X would look great in that, <laughs> wouldn't it? Though, and the cool thing about AM four, you can just boop, add four yeah. more cores. Drop it right in. Drop it right in. Your 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 legacy on that, and then we probably have a couple more questions in the chat, right, Marco? Your, your legacy on socket migration compatibility has been strong. Um, as as we as we scale the architectures now, we're in third gen Ryzen. <clears throat> are there some additional challenges coming down the pipe with that and and maintaining that socket compatibility, or is AM four really 
does it have the legs for, you know, the foreseeable horizon, I guess, maybe? It's, it might be a tough question. It is, it is a tough question. You know, we said that we'd maintain that socket till 2020. Uh, 2020 is coming up. Uh, but right now, who knows? Because uh, technology has this weird way of moving sometimes really fast and other mm. times really slow. So it's hard to see out longer term where it might go. Um, certainly, we've made good on our, our maintain this socket promise. Um, and I guess we'll see where we go from here. You know, I can't obviously disclose a whole lot uh, about the roadmap, but we understand that compatibility is important to people. We understand that we have uh, a reputation there and we know it's valued and we value it too. So all of these things are factoring into our thinking about where we go, future products. I wish sure. I could say that. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, no, no. And it, and it makes logical sense. And, and I, we totally get that you can't speak about future products, but it, it makes logical sense that it's um, it, it's also a sales advantage for you as well, right? Sure. I mean, system sure. system OEMs will, will shift gears on sockets because they can, you know, a, a little bit more easily architect a new motherboard. I mean, not easily, but it's not trivial, but architect a new motherboard would have you a, a new system shell around mm -hmm. it. Um, but in the channel, if you have a compatible socket and you introduce a new chip that's more powerful, better features in that same socket, you're like yeah. more likely to sell, you know, to the to the upgraders, and that that makes perfect sense as well. I Good mean, stuff. <clears throat> I, on the socket front, I, I I think that nobody has ever accomplished in x86 what we've done with AM4. If you if you think back, that started as a 28 nanometer four core four thread socket uh and yeah. <laughs> that was a bristol ridge that was the bristol ridge product and today it's seven nanometers so three new three process nodes newer uh at quadruple the core count and like eight times the pci express bandwidth all in the same socket yeah and there was a clean upgrade path that whole way and so, yeah, there's some exceptions along the way. You know, the, sometimes that motherboard over there doesn't support that chip over there. But that's kind of the opportunity cost of having support matrix as large as we do. Yeah. I think yeah. we've done heroic stuff. Well, I mean, PCI Express Gen 4, you know, even though right now it's predominantly just, I mean, the, the value prop is storage. Yeah. Um, that's that's still impressive you're, you're ahead of the curve again on that one versus versus intel i mean honestly that's like wow we didn't we didn't really see that coming and and it's it's pervasive now and you you're seeing ssd nvme ssd manufacturers getting behind it quickly um because they can get more bandwidth and you know better performing products it's it's a beautiful thing well the, the other thing too that i like <laughs> about gen 4 is even if you don't have a device necessarily let me put it. Let me put it another way. A, a by eight slot in Gen four is every bit as good as a mm. by sixteen slot in Gen three. So what you've mm. effectively done is doubled the amount of use practically usable slots on a motherboard yeah. without adding more I/O to the CPU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is big. Yeah. Um, we got more questions in the chat or, or Marco, did you want to dive in? Cause I can see yeah, you look so, like you're, uh... well, you sort of, you answered a bunch of questions just over the, over the course of the conversation that came in the chat. Um, we had okay. a thread ripper question, question, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute before we run out of time. I want to just jump back for one second. And this is a point I try to make anytime we talk multi-core processors or, or multi-socket servers is that, you know, there's always somebody in, in a chat or in a, in a group that'll say, oh, yeah, well, you're never going to use all those cores. You, you don't run an app that uses all those cores. But everyone needs to understand that every every uh, process on Windows, every application you run, even if it's single threaded, if you're running multiple apps, you can take advantage of those core resources. So maybe at one particular moment right now, someone's running an app or a set of apps that don't leverage all those cores, having them not only does it build in some future proofing, but it, it, it does equate to a smoother overall experience because you have less contention for that CPU. You have more resources available for the breadth of apps on a system. That's just something to consider as well. 
Um, you know, I, I've been, I was running dual CPU boards all the way back from the Celeron days and socket 370. Wow. Uh, right. Yeah. So like, you know, it's something that I, I, I love that kind of stuff. Now we just had a bunch of stuff hit the chat quickly. Oh, wait, big chat development, main gear CEO in the chat. Wallace Santos is here. <laughs> uh, what's now up, what's up, Wallace? <laughs> the party now, now we can get started. What's up, man? Um, so we have Chris asking if I've run benchmarks on Keyshot 9. I have not. Um, is 3950X the fastest CPU we will get for AM4? I doubt. Uh, feel like answering that one, Robert, or is that something you, uh, you're not going to answer? <laughs> what? Okay. All right. Hold on. I want to. I want to tackle this just real briefly. <laughs> um, there is a U.S. law from the uh, Federal Trade Commission called Regulation <laughs> Fair Disclosure Reg FD, and it means that a publicly traded company has to go to great lengths to notify investors if something material about the company's future is disclosed. And uh, a podcast, sorry guys, is not <laughs> enough for that law. So uh, you know, until you see it on a press release or a broad blast in the news, I, I can't talk about it yeah. by law. And I, I don't feel like screwing around with the, fred, the feds today. So that's yeah. not on my radar. No, we'll we'll pass on that for <laughs> yeah. sure. But I don't know. Our podcast is pretty important, Robert. I mean, come on. <laughs> hey, no doubt, no doubt. Now we just have to convince the heads of that. <laughs> yep. Good stuff. And and actually, uh, I'll I'll pile on and give uh, Wallace a a warm welcome here to say that my feed is now being broadcasted on a Ryzen nine thirty nine hundred X powered main gear vibe that we built with main gear at the facility. Great guys! If you're ever in the Kenilworth, New Jersey area, go check them out, and then check them out online. Main Gear, and they build some I, ha I have his backpack bits. behind me too. Oh my <laughs> god, <laughs> Wallace! You didn't even pay us to say this stuff, dude. <laughs> All right, oh, so, there it goes the big logo. There you go. All there right. you go. Well, I think we should talk about a future product. We'll have to tap dance a little bit, but yeah, um, this is one of those times where AMD has disclosed some information about the upcoming products. Let, let's let's definitely talk about Threadripper because they are uh, they're going to be monsters. So the first and second gen Threadrippers, um, tons of compute resources, but maybe had some performance quirks because not every compute die had memory attached, and there was multiple NUMA nodes and. Lots of stuff to contend with, and that stuff seems to have been addressed in these new Threadrippers. It's the Zen 2 cores, just like what's in the 3950X. Um, new motherboards, new topology. Robert, what do you want to tell us about these upcoming Threadrippers? Well, I, I think the key takeaway is that the new Threadripper is extremely consistent, reliable, and deterministic from a performance perspective. And kind of whatever workload we have looked at. Um, let me take a step back. We have analyzed 65 individual workloads or 95 if you break out spec workstation three into its own little parts. So nearly 100 workloads. And we have not found one where we are anything less than a tie on that product. <laughs> uh, the average is like 60% leadership with frequent peaks of 100 to 200% faster than competing solutions. Um, so when I say consistent, it is across the board in compiling and rendering and video encoding, photogrammetry, fluid dynamics, simulation, like you name it, guys. It's, it's a killer freaking product. Um, so architecture helps, the new layout helps, faster memory helps. Everything that is good in third gen Ryzen is just bigger and better on this product. Very cool. Wow. Wow. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is hands down the most fun I have ever had working on a product. It is so fast and so consistently fast. Like it's kind of unbelievable getting the data back because we're like, oh, this seems too good. Like <laughs> where's wow. the <laughs> but there we haven't found one. And and did we did we talk high level specs yet on it? Um, yeah. yeah. What's the what? Yeah. What's the cache uh, allotment in in Threadripper? Uh, uh, I believe uh, it's one hundred and forty megs for the twenty four <laughs> core model, and one hundred and forty four for the thirty two. That is just insane. You, you know, and, and I'm, I want to go back to cache real quick. I I, I was a 
a chip gearhead for for many years. I was a semiconductor sales engineer um, with IDT, and one of the things, and we did a lot of specialty memory products. And one of the things about SRAM cache, you know, on chip CPU cache, is it's very expensive in terms of die real estate. Are you able to afford that much cash? And I, I know you need it when you have that many cores. It's important because sure. you're going to have a lot of thrashing going on, you know, between threads and cores. Um, is is the fact that you can actually get that much cash? I mean, obviously, it's a big package too. But because you have the the seven nanometer uh, efficiency in silicon, I mean, that's just. I mean, that's a, a ridiculous amount of cash, dude. <laughs> sure. Well, seven nanometer. Clearly helps with SRAM cell size, um, yeah. but but also chiplets play a big role too because you don't have to make this massive monolithic die with 288 megs or 144 megs or however many megs uh, all in one chip, right? Um, it just it, it's uh, just a little bit of cache in each, each CCD, and mm. that's easier. And then you can yeah. just stick it all together with cache coherence. So yeah. that's the economy of scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I mean, God, we've we've come a long way with the architectures. The architectures really these tough. days are so dramatically different. Um, core architectures and whatnot. Good stuff, Marco. I'm sorry. I <laughs> jump right back in there. I geeked out for a minute on memory. <laughs> no, I, I want to just. I'm going to geek out for a second. Um, I'm not breaking <clears throat> in, in any embargo because the motherboard guys have already shown off their their new motherboards for the Threadripper. But um, oh, I, yeah. I happened to get my hands on on a motherboard for the new Threadrippers, oh, okay. and it was so freaking heavy. <laughs> That I brought it to my wife with a, a standard motherboard. And I said, okay. I said, pick up this board. I said, this is yeah. a really nice motherboard. I'm like, pick that up. She said, okay. I said, now pick this one up. And even she was like, holy crap. Like, it was sick. There's so much metal yeah. on this board. It's awesome. Um, I won't talk about which one next. I don't, I'm tickling with it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't <laughs> now, speaking of motherboards, though, this was, a, this was a, I know this was a difficult decision inside AMD. Um, the, the upcoming Threadrippers, they use the same socket but not the same motherboards and they're not interchangeable you can't put a previous gen thread ripper on these new boards and you can't put the new thread rippers into one of the previous gen boards can you talk a little bit about that decision and why that is sure so uh just context last year we had socket tr4 and this year we have trx4 and as you said marco they're not interoperable um i it's it's a contentious decision. We, we understand that. But our goal with Threadripper is to make it the absolute fastest, best possible product that we possibly can. And there are some tantalizing things that we could do with a new socket that were not possible in the old one. Um, we could quadruple the bandwidth between the CPU and the chipset with the new socket. So you can run more simultaneous devices off uh, the new TRX40 chipset. Um, we have some ambitious scalability goals for the socket <laughs> that could not be supported. Ah. Let's leave it at that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's both on a, a near-term basis and a long-term basis. Um, and you know, in time, it will be clear why we made this choice. Uh, but for performance, for driving the highest amount of performance we can, it had to happen. Uh, and mm. we were not willing to kneecap ourselves uh, with, with the old socket. Got it. Makes sense. And it, do, do, <clears throat> does you guys see that a customer that would buy a Threadripper, um, they're typically more open to a, a total sort of system upgrade like that anyway. At least that's my opinion. Would you agree with that? The data inside bears that out. We find that most consumers in this space do a total system refresh, and they typically buy uh, in multiple systems at a time. Yeah. So and this one, um, I, I think you'll probably be able to answer because you, you were talking about workloads that you've already run. With, uh, with the previous gen Threadrippers, um, you know, as we mentioned, there were always there were some instances due to the, due to the architecture where performance wasn't always predictable and consistent. Are you finding somebody that may buy, let's say somebody buys a, a next-gen Threadripper setup versus a 3950X today, are there any scenarios where that Threadripper may not perform on the same level as a 3950X or is the new architecture as such where it's just predictable and it's mm. it's gonna work? 
uh, we haven't encountered anything. The, the only thing that I can think of is there are a few older games, and we're talking one hand's worth of titles that are really meant, designed explicitly for a small number of cores. Yeah. And they don't handle Threadripper core counts all that well, but um, just usually degraded performance. Um, but on the whole, it's, it's like a supersized 3900X, 3800X. So it's a nice experience. Mm. Yeah, man. It's, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of excited. I'm, I'm a little bit excited to, uh, to get Windows installed and, and play with that thing. Um, uh, me too. <laughs> so, Robert, what what are you running today? What's what's in? Yeah, your I was gonna, I was gonna. What, what's he's got all the toys, so he must have the good stuff. Well, I have a thirty nine hundred X in my system at home. Asus Crosshair Eight, uh, hand tuned DDR four thirty six hundred. Um, got a thirty four forty by fourteen forty hundred twenty hertz monitor on my desk. Love it. Uh, mm. But I do have the thirty nine fifty X ready to go. Yeah, <laughs> can't wait. <laughs> cool. Cool, good stuff. Um, what else? Do we have any more questions in the chat here? Let me look through. Just a bunch of thumbs up and wows when we started talking about Threadripper. So that's good stuff. That's good. Good to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what do you What do you think uh, the future looks like for you guys? You know, in terms of um, you know just just your your competitive position in the market. And uh, I know today where today where. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't, I'm not asking you to speculate on your competitor, but today you're in a position where, you know, what you're announcing is in a lot of SKUs, you know, versus Intel, um, significantly, um, you know, compelling, you know, mu- you know, impressive. Um, and in a lot of cases, a, a better value proposition, you just can't argue it, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's, it's a better price. The performance is, is better. Um, how do you think that, looks like what what are you expecting from i guess um you know the the firefight moving forward if you will and um uh, i know you folks don't rest on your laurels over there um that's that's not in your dna but um you know where at some point we know 10 nanometer for intel is going to get there um i guess just what are your thoughts on the the competitive threat and 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 what's your uh, your chances of continuing this amazing trajectory that you're on? Mm-hmm. Frankly, <clears throat> well, I would say um, you know I would echo what Mark Papermaster has said on several occasions uh, that we do have uh, the Zen three and the Zen four architectures uh, in the pipeline uh, at various stages of development, um, and and you have seen from AMD what new architectures can do for our products. So having a consistent flow of of new IP coming in is advantageous, keeps us competitive. Uh, but in, in 2019, uh, I think the market reality, and I think the 3950X reviews bear this out, is that our mainstream socket AM4 meets or beats my competitors' high-end desktop platform from a mm. performance perspective. And mm. I think that has to be challenging for them because Threadripper from above is offering so much more, so much more performance. And so there's a, a sandwich effect going on uh, mm. where at either end of the spectrum, I think I would argue that we're the better choice. Yes, I'm biased, but I think the numbers bear that out. Um, and so, you know, I can't speculate where they're going to go, but I understand that we put them in a difficult competitive position with some very, very good products for people. Um, mm. And that's what we're going to continue to keep doing. And we have an IP roadmap that can support it. Yeah. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on, and there's an actually an interesting question in the chat. Can AMD meet the demand for the server side of the business? Um, I, th- I think there's a lot of volume when it comes to consumer and, and enterprise, you know, commercial consumer, um, or commercial, excuse me, client, um, but but server and data center is a different type of um, uh, validation and quality level and all that good stuff. Sure. Um, interesting question. I don't know if you can field that um, for for Epic and all that good stuff. I, I wish I could, but I don't. I don't work on Epic at AMD, so I don't. I don't have the faintest idea. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so I know I know Robert can't answer this, but I have to I have All to right. call out this user. Um, we have a Captain Amiga in the chat, so you know okay. I'm happy as I wear my Commodore 64 shirt. There we yeah. go. Commodore <laughs> Ripper, baby. Um, he's asking if there'll ever be a 16 core Threadripper. That's, That's a good the, question. The 3950X too. is basically, it, it, it's just got two fewer memory channels, but 3950X is 16 core Ryzen 2. I don't think Robert can mention a lower core count Threadripper. It's a possibility, but if you already have 16 cores on the mainstream socket, probably not a priority. Uh, fair, fair to say, Robert? I think I can tackle that a little bit. I, our okay. stack is is for, our stack is done for, for this year. And, um, you know, we, we don't have any plans to introduce a 16-core thread because our strategy is based around having that 3950X with 16 cores being the entry point. It, it does offer HEDT class performance. It is much faster than previous gen 16-core CPUs. Yep. Um, and we find that at the entry level of HEDT, people aren't actually taking advantage of memory bandwidth or lanes very often. And, and I know there's going to be that one guy who's like, I run 57 VMs, I need 11 terabytes of RAM, <laughs> and I hear you, man, I do, I acknowledge you, but uh, <laughs> you know, we, we can only make so many products. And for us, that 16-core that entry in AM4, we're going to try it, see how it goes, see if it satisfies the market uh, for creatives. The performance is absolutely there. So we don't see a lot of need to redundantly produce another 16 core product. And we think that it would be confusing for the market. Yeah. And, and just to set some per perspective too, we're, we're a little over a year out from the release of the 2950X. So mm -hmm. the previous gen, and, and now the mainstream socket is a faster part. Like that's, that's, right. that's, that's no joke. I'm like, that's impressive no matter how you slice yeah. it from a company the size of amd um you know obviously growing now but there was a lot of years there where amd was was really really trim it, it was tight for a while there but um to, to pull off what amd has and to get that kind of performance today out of a 3950x like they're literally they're even, they're beating their own previous gen hedd part uh awesome. with the mainstream socket that's it's pretty impressive um pretty good stuff <laughs> Good stuff. That, that's what we want to do. I mean, I, driving performance upwards in the mainstream socket is so cool because it benefits so many more people. HEDT is is important. It plays a big role in the market for a certain category of buyer, but it's that mainstream socket that carries the weight uh, for a company. And um, so advancing that performance and pushing the line of where HEDT is and mainstream desktop is, pushing that line up is, is our goal. That is our strategy. We want to bring these previously elite classes of performance to more people in a more affordable platform. And I, I think over time, people will uh, broadly come to appreciate that decision because I think it fully hasn't been felt yet because Threadripper hasn't launched, but I, I really do believe that the shape of the market and how the market is like divided between the small socket and the big socket, it's really starting to change. And that is due to AM4. Yep, nice. And and I have a question. Uh, put put Robert on the spot a little bit um, oh, sure. <laughs> relative to AM4 sockets, um, a little bit as well. Um, motherboards. Um, and I know you, you must have a you know, favorites in mind that you can think of for AM4. But but what are you seeing from your 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 various uh, ecosystem partners in terms of motherboard technology that impresses you, that sort of stands out as, hey, folks, if you haven't checked this this motherboard out, this model, this this uh, architecture trend, this design trend, you should. Any any thoughts there? <clears throat> uh, I so I'm gonna I'm gonna name a couple solutions that I really like. Um, the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme, I don't even know how to pronounce that word. I'm so sorry, guys. I've never heard it said out loud. I <laughs> Aorus, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, that is a killer board. They've done a lot of engineering work to have a passive solution for the, um, for the chipset. And uh, I think that really speaks to their engineering prowess and their ability to go a long way. Um, I love the BIOSes in Asus motherboards. Uh, I am a Crosshair 8 user myself. Just love the way 
that firmware is laid out and functions. Um, but you know, all the vendors, uh, ASRock and MSI too, they all have some pretty cool, unique products, and they've really gone all in on third gen Ryzen with um, some unique designs. So I, all of us really appreciate what they've what they've done to endorse our product, and we think, uh, and we'll certainly tell the media this because we're here, uh, yeah. that you know the amount of adoption you receive from your motherboard vendors is a really nice indicator of the confidence uh, in your product because they're not going to bet on you otherwise. Yeah, you know that that's interesting. You mentioned that I was actually at um, a PAX show, PAX PAX East in Boston, last year. At this time, um, just prior to it was, um, this is March, April, just prior to Computex, uh, when third gen Ryzen was going to hit. And <clears throat> I was talking to the guys from Gigabyte and they were literally giddy. They were like, oh, yeah. dude, 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 third gen Ryzen is going to be awesome. And <laughs> it was just funny to, to get the excitement from them. And I said, well, we can't really talk about it too much, but you know, just next year, this time, you know, we're going to be really happy with, with, you know, our product offering. And so, yeah, I think there is some uh, you know, serious momentum behind you. And uh, it's good for everybody to have that that choice of exciting, you know, new technology, not just the same old stuff, um, something new every year. And um, you guys have certainly brought it, you know, frankly. You know, all the other guys are still churning a little bit on f 14 nanometer plus 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 plus. I mean, you know, in, it's it's to a point now where we're we're sort of rooting. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of getting philosophical, but we're almost rooting a little bit for Intel as an underdog now. It's like, okay, get it back in gear. Um, so, anyways, just great stuff. Kudos to you, Marco. Any other questions uh, from the chat or in your rolling around in your head before we? Uh, let poor Robert Robert go here off the hot seat. <laughs> yeah, we, we did get some questions about um, motherboard <laughs> vendors, you know, perhaps ASRock making an X570 workstation board. That stuff we should probably ask ASRock for you, uh, Captain Amiga. Um, and we do have some, we have to reiterate that we're giving away a killer um, Ryzen-based rig. We'll talk about that at the end. But I, I have one more question for Robert. He may not be able right. to answer. But, you know, with all that bandwidth between Threadripper and, um, and the chipset, and PCIe 4, and I know a lot of these motherboards are coming with these insane cards where you can do four uh, M.2 mm -hmm. storage solutions. Have you guys done anything sick in the lab in terms of storage and seen just some insane bandwidth <laughs> between you know, uh, storage bandwidth that you could talk about? So with one of these riser cards hosting four NVMe uh, and the motherboard also capable of natively hosting four NVMe all at full speed, <laughs> uh, that is uh, an eight-way Gen 4 uh, RAID right. array, and uh, the iometer numbers are astronomical. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you can just run the numbers, right? Take the peak transfer speed of one of these disks and multiply by eight, and that's what you're basically getting. It's outrageously good. That's um, nuts. I, I don't know. do that on video. <laughs> I, I would love to, but I, I don't know what people are going to do. Possible. I'm just thrilled about because when you build it, people will find something cool to do with it. So yeah, 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 yeah. And I just want to is... see the really big long bar chart. Is all I want. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to switch to logarithmic y-axis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I I did that once years ago and got roasted in the comments, so I can't do it anymore. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm waiting to get roasted as well because in the reviewer guide for Threadripper, there is one chart that had to switch to logarithmic because of the, the disparity between the high and the low tests on that chart, and I couldn't really split them up into multiple charts. I put a footnote there. Hopefully people see it, but I'm waiting for the angry. Sorry, guys. Oh, they're coming. They're coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Good stuff. Uh, Marco, any other questions on, on Threadripper that you, you have? And I know you're, you're starting to, to, to fire it up a little bit. I don't know if you, you know. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll bug Robert privately and we'll disclose everything we can when the embargo lifts. How's that? <laughs> That'll do there it. you go. There you go. That's, that's probably a wise choice. I'm just trying to be an instigator as always. <laughs> um, 
Cool. Well, well, Robert, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us. Did, did you have any questions for us, by the way, before you? I mean, we've been peppering you. It's only fair. If you have questions for us, we can try and answer something. Well, well I've got <laughs> one, and uh, are you guys going to be at CES? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. We, will be, right. we will be at CES. Um, Marco and I both, we will be there reporting, uh, on the floor, boots on the ground. We, we actually show up early this year. It's, it's like this every year we get, we get asked to show up early before the show and, um, you know, a couple of days before, and then we, we leave early when everybody, you know, the show starts and everybody sh- you know, floods that town, we yep. get the heck out of Vegas. Um, <laughs> so so that's kind of our strategy. It tends to be our strategy. Do you guys, would you guys have some exciting things to say at CES? Uh, I have beers I'd like to drink with you at CES. Oh, <laughs> I'll just there throw that go. out there. <laughs> <laughs> We're always excited about beers. Yeah, We're, that's we'll, fun. Any libations. Absolutely. That, yeah. I will take you up on that. Um, yeah, no, that's always fun. And, and CES is, uh, is a great show for that, for, for being able to get together and meet all Perfect. those people that you deal with. Yeah. All year long. Um, Marco, why don't you tell the folks before we, we uh, sign off here, why don't you tell the folks what we are giving away as we speak at, in the next week or so, we're going to be announcing a winner, but folks can still get in. I threw a link in the chat and it's, it's an all AMD affair, right? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so this is an absolutely insane rig. A couple of weeks back, um, the, the outer worlds game launched and it also happened to coincide with, Falcon North Northwest 20th anniversary. It's also Hot Hardware's 20th anniversary online this year. So the stars kind of aligned. We're giving away an absolutely insanely gorgeous uh, Ryzen uh, 7 3800X powered rig. 16 gigs in this beautifully painted case with a Radeon 7. Just I, I think Chris is flashing some pictures of the system now. If you haven't seen it, come by the site. Look at this rig. It is just it's jaw-droppingly nice inside and out. And it's super easy to win. You just have to like a couple of social media pages. And that's really it. And you'll be entered into the drawing to win this guy. We're going to pick the winner really soon. Yeah, specs are um, Ryzen 7 3800X, Radeon 7, 32 gigs of RAM, uh, 750 watt EVGA power supply, uh, one terabyte NVMe SSD by Intel. I mean, uh, Intel 660p. Um, yeah, just all kinds of good stuff and a killer paint job from the folks at Falcon Northwest. Um, what do you think about that guy, Robert? Huh? Not not too bad, huh? Well, I'm a big <laughs> fan. Uh, actually, I've been playing Outer Worlds recently, and it is a lot of fun. It, is it, it? Oh my god, it's so entertaining. Uh, it it feels sort of Fallout ish, and I don't know how game de- developers feel about their game being compared to other games, but uh, it feels very familiar and comfortable <laughs> to play. And there's a lot of good humor in the game. So if you haven't played it, check it out. I think it's worthy of people's time. They developed. Wow. Fallout New Vegas, at least. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's Chris. What was that, Chris? Say it again. The, uh, they at least developed Fallout New Vegas. I don't remember if they did other oh. ones or not. So, yes, that yeah. is very Fallout. Ob- obs- Obsidian Entertainment, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Ah, cool. Well, yeah, Check. so check that out. It's, uh, it's adorned with some great graphics. And, uh, yeah, giving it away soon. You can enter. There's multiple ways to enter, all kinds of following and liking going on um to to get in on that um available to you and then yes of course hit thumbs up and subscribe here on youtube and uh you can find us at twitter um at hot hardware uh we're all over the web facebook hot hardware you you know where to find us folks robert thank you so much for spending so much time with us and answering all of our questions and i'm I'm hoping we didn't get you into trouble in any spot did we so far, no, but I know <laughs> that my uh, amazing PR people are either watching or listening, and I haven't checked my email in a while, so <laughs> we'll see what happens. But guys, it's always a huge pleasure. Um, we've known each other for a long time. I've been a hot hardware reader for a long time. Um, uh, you're a good so, man. You know, we, we really appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about products. Good stuff, and we appreciate what you guys are doing in the market. It's great to have some exciting products to talk about. Makes our job easy. Uh, gives us, uh, you know, content to to spin up and uh, keeps keeps the lights on here. So it's good stuff. Marco, anything else to say before we uh, sign off for the viewers? No, I think you said it all, Robert. I just a uh, heartfelt thanks for coming on the show. Um, I, we, literally, all we had, to, all I did was tweet Robert, say, "Hey, you want to come on the show?" That's how easy it was. Yeah, um, thanks it. for making it easy. Thanks for, you know, answering all the questions. Really, really, really appreciate it. Anytime, Marco. Thanks, Marco. Thanks, Thanks, brother.
Yeah, no problem. And uh, thanks, everybody, for stopping by. We'll see you in the next one.